our contested county and state senate district 11 candidate forums before we get started um, i'm going to give you a little pitch here for the pity penny the power of the penny and encourage everyone to vote for this this each municipality and Carver County, this, this is vital money for them. Uh, just to give you a, a little example of, of what it brings in. The county alone last year was $702,173.88, just from the fifth penny. Um, to date, the county has brought in $236,998. Last year in September it was 81,000, and this year so far September or September was 103,118.58. So um, there's some activity out there that's generating um, some sales tax revenue. Uh, the treasurer suspects that it was probably due to the same purchase um, turnaround that's going on. But those dollars go to each community and to the county, and they use it for pretty much basic services anymore and it's been in existence um, for 41 years the county we use ours uh, the biggest chunk goes to the senior services uh, that provides the match for their federal grant we also fund um, the ambulance swims with it uh, fire department the fairgrounds and the fair economic development youth crisis center um, in the new addition we um, use that for for the youth crisis center operation um, we saw also donate to entities that we are a partner with in the form of joint powers, which is um, the old Penn joint powers. We gave some money in the Rollins Airport, um, Rollins Kirkland County Airport, uh, the county. And um, there's a card over there. There's some posters that show you where all the local municipalities use this. Um, but this is vital, so we would encourage you um, to vote yes on the fifth penny. Tonight, we are going to start out with our um, Lone County Commissioner candidate who's shown up to all of these by himself. <laughs> and, and we're uh, not going to put him on the spot, but uh, we will give him the mic here and, and give him a few minutes to uh, discuss why he's running and, and some of his plans for the County Commission. Uh, Don Quinn, who is um, not here this evening, is the Democratic candidate for county commissioner. Um, Byron Barkers, who is here this evening, is a Republican candidate. And I would ask Byron to come up and take a few minutes to tell us whatever you want to. You're, you're becoming an old hand at doing names by yourself. And you can stand or sit, whatever whatever you want. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, my name is Byron Barker. I uh, grew up here in the valley, and uh, many of you know me. I uh, know my family's been here for uh, quite some time, and uh, my wife and I moved back after college uh, in 2004, and uh, we've been on the ranch. And uh, we have five uh, amazing kids. Uh, we've got two girls in college, and, uh, and three boys are at home with us. Um, they're getting ready to drive, which is why I don't have much hair left. <laughs> uh, on a serious note, um, uh, I had the opportunity to serve on the Carver County Planning and Zoning Commission for the last two years. Um, it's been a pleasure to do that and to uh, see the changes that are coming in the county um, and to be a part of, of serving in that capacity. And during that, that time, um, I felt led to uh, run for a seat on the Board of County Commissioners and I felt like it was an opportunity that I could give back to the community that uh, has given so much to me and, and uh, be a part of um, working to preserve um, what we all come to love about Carbon County and uh, do the best that I can to be a part of that vote to move things forward and um, also to help watch and, and take care of the things that we enjoy. I guess that's about it. Um, are we going to do questions? Yeah, or? if anybody has some questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm Jeff Hall. I'm running for 
assisting with recycling of the county residents. We're struggling right now in the county to get our plastic recycled. We're still doing cardboard pretty well in federal places, but here about here, right here in town and elsewhere. <coughs> but plastic is difficult and struggling. Does the county have any role at all in attempting to make recycling Broader, more effective, easier, helping find markets. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what their capacity is. Um, thank you. Um, from what I understand, most most of the the refuse is getting not shipped to Casper. Out of Rollins. Out of Rollins, and then to Casper. Casper. Yeah, we know it's still in Casper and we're going to. What, what would be some ways that we could help? Um, what, what could we do uh, as a board to help with that? Well, I think the problem is there's no money in plastic. With the Chinese and Asian markets closed uh, to virtually closed, it's almost worthless. It's almost a couple of bucks a bale. And they don't weigh much. It's you can't even make parade as I understand the details of it. Um, and Rollins is still doing it. And I'm encouraging people here in the valley to take their plastic to Rollins. But it's questionable whether Rollins <coughs> the city council is subsidizing it. And it's questionable whether Rollins will continue to be able to uh, carry it, carry the Whole county, they'll take it right now from anybody who will bring it. I, my understanding is, and I'm not as bold as that, they've given up on the idea almost completely. So it would almost take some subsidy to uh, help some, somebody like Rollins, the big place, that's got a program, to continue to carry it and get it shipped, even if it's. If this isn't proper. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm not aware of any um, funding that's been used by the county to do that, but I'm uh, maybe not involved in that, that portion of it. But I'd definitely be interested in uh, sitting down and visiting with your ideas about uh, what could be done and what we could do. Obviously, we would want to have it be something that uh, would benefit the community. And you know, have approval of the, the community that's been taxpayer dollars to, to subsidize that. Thank you. Mr. Schreck. Well, you and I had a curbside in, uh, uh, visit this morning, and I, I think you need to do something, my friend. Is uh, There's a lot of people out here probably don't know where you even live. They probably don't know about your family history. And I'd like to see you tell us that. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I don't like uh, you know, like putting myself out there, but um, I'll do that for you. Um, uh, my family has uh, been here actually uh, 132 years in the valley. Um, my great great grandparents came here on the wagon with about eight kids in tow. Uh, they lost. Or four of them over the period of coming out from back east. Um, they actually landed in Rock Springs first and um, they uh, worked on the railroad. Um, their oldest son, Jesse, was in high school during the Chinese massacre that happened uh, right outside of Green River, actually. And on their um, travels and on their way back, um, they landed in uh, Fort Steele. And uh, they purchased the hotel uh, that used to be the Army Barracks. And they ran the hotel for uh, quite a few years, even after they homesteaded uh, on the place that I live on now, which is up on Brush.
<laughs> um, so I have deep roots, um, things that I don't take really for granted, things that are very important and uh, very real to me. Getting me out of this valley would, would take a pretty big tree for. So that's kind of a little bit of the, the history on my family. I oftentimes uh, go into the hay field and <clears throat> lean over my shoulder and, or look over my shoulder and, and uh, or lean it on a, a shovel sometimes and reflect upon the fact that that ground was all sagebrush. And in my family, the men and women and children included, Slips and pickaxes, and it's pretty neat to, to stand up there and to see and think about and to ponder the blood, sweat, and tears that have been poured into them. So I take it very serious. I'm very honored to, to be standing here and very honored to be running for county commissioner. And, and uh, I'm sure, sure be honored by your vote as well. Any other questions? I like questions. <laughs> Scott, how about you? We all start, huh? <laughs> okay, now, now would you uh, vote as a commissioner to reduce the number of mills levied against the assessed valuation of the county if the county starts? Increasing in at a rate of value larger than the rate of inflation? Excellent question. I've actually been pondering that. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, some of you may not know, I'm also a real estate broker. Um, I opened my own office back in March. And um, so I get to see a lot of the real estate part of things and uh, assessments. And uh, I was actually doing a market analysis this morning, and I'll, I'll try to make this brief and get to that. Your question, Scott. But um, I was looking at a property near the property I was in market analysis on, and I won't mention what part of the county it was in or anything like that. But there was a 41-acre lot um, that had an assessed valuation of six hundred and ninety-seven dollars, um, roughly seventeen and eighteen bucks a, an acre. So I think there's a lot of work that we can do um, to get those numbers current still reduce the amount of uh, mill levy and taxation that people are uh, experiencing. But a lot of our uh, tax dollars does come from property taxes. Um, one of the questions that I had for uh, the assessor candidates at the forum in Rollins was, uh, what is the process of when a uh, entity applies for a conditional use permit, how long within that period of them receiving that conditional use permit is that portion of the property within the CUP uh, changed in the assessed value so that it reflects the conditional use permit and what is the process of doing that and I still have yet to learn that answer but I think as we see the growth and we, to get to your question Scott to the growth that we're seeing in Carbon County at this point, with the information I have, I would absolutely support that as long as those larger, bigger corporations are being taxed fairly on the lands and the properties that they have put within their CDPs that will help cover the, the reduction of the number. Does that help answer the question? Or did I, did I, maybe I didn't understand. Well, times when the assessed value was going up so fast in the county, the money coming into the treasury from property taxes per parcel was going up faster than the rate of inflation, and they just spent it. So I'm, uh, pretty conservative about um, my feelings. So my vote would be to make sure that our 
property taxes stay in line with inflation so that we don't go over the, the top and go past that. But I appreciate you bringing it up. Pretty well put on the to sleep, I think. <laughs> My wife says I have a soothing voice. <laughs> always when I'm telling her about my opinion, she falls asleep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So, do you want this or not? I'm just turning it over to my cohort. Um, right now, I'm um, going to turn it over to Kathy Westring. She's my um, replacement political junkie for when I get too old to do this. <laughs> um, and she's going to do the um, county assessors and the county sheriff candidates. So, Kathy, do you want to come up and get started? And, and you can introduce him to Carol, our, our timer. You have to introduce me. I just want to know if you want me to do it. <laughs> We're going to time out for fire <laughs> All right, so first up tonight. Um, will be the county assessor, assessor candidates. So, Ms. Snyder and Ms. Bunch, you come up. Any more would be great. Good evening, ladies. So tonight we will start off with um, um, a two-minute window for you to tell us about yourself and why you're running. So um, Ms. West, would you go first? And um, Carol Sherrod, another BSO member, is going to no, find you, so be courteous of the timer when it does go off. It's not working, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> you're ready. <laughs> you're ready. It's not going to go. Uh, Oh, really? Okay. okay. <laughs> I'd like to thank the, the BSO and the Platte Valley Community Center for holding this forum tonight. I'd also like to thank those of you in attendance for your time. I have eight years' experience in real estate and property valuation, almost half of which uh, I spent serving the county as deputy assessor. Uh, I am permanently certified as a property tax appraiser, and I'm also a member of the International Association of Assessment Officers. Uh, in addition to the knowledge I already uh, possess as far as the department's function, um, the Department of Revenue does put on uh, a new assessor orientation for all newly elected assessors as they, you know, peek into their uh, position. So. Um, I definitely would look forward to learning um, policy and procedure directly from the state since they ultimately are the entity um, who approves um, our department's work. Um, success at any level of government cannot be accomplished without a collaboration of all members involved and, and working uh, with, the, with the county commission, county attorney, treasurer's office, and state entities that will be a priority for myself. Uh, great mass appraisals cannot be accomplished without accurate data at the individual property appraisal level. Uh, the positions within the assessor's office are specialized uh, and require uh, a well-trained and well-managed staff to ensure um, their jobs are being done uh, correctly um, and efficiently. And I believe that uh, increased staff training and education would be a must. Uh, I also believe that it is your right to be informed on how property values are arrived at. Um, and I don't believe that current access to that information is easy or convenient. Um, along with having more information available in the office uh, and online, I would like to hold community workshops uh, to talk with the public one-on-one -on -one about all things property valuation, um, as well as informing them on any changes to rules, regulations, or legislation that could potentially impact uh, property values moving forward. Uh, property valuation is a, is a complicated matter, um, and I hope uh, to bridge that gap. Hi. Good evening, and thank you everyone for coming. My name is Renee Snyder, and I am running for Carbon County Assessor. 
I have been employed in the assessor's office for four years as deputy assessor. I am the only candidate that is employed by the assessor's office. Earlier in my campaign, I had stated that one of my main goals will be to keep the property taxes at the lowest level of appraisal, but stay within the Department of Revenue and the State Board of Equalization guidelines, and to continue to work with the public in a professional, courteous manner and to resolve any issues that may arise. I know how to supervise the employees in the office, and I will have helpful and courteous employees to assist the public as well as work with the other offices. Since the assessor announced she is retiring, I have been working one-on-one -on -one with her, learning the specific duties and responsibilities of the assessor. And I am the only person that she has worked with to teach me what she does and what she's responsible for. In order, if I am elected, to make the transition as smooth as possible. Anyone can stand up here and say changes needs to be made and this isn't being done or that isn't being done. And the way the assessor has done things may be right or wrong, individual issues, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I will have my own way of running the office and handling the assessor duties. In closing, I am a leader and I am ready to take on the responsibilities of the Carbon County Assessor. Thank you. There is much discussion regarding residential properties being assessed at a higher rate than the property owner feels they are worth. There have been, excuse me, there have been properties sold at values lower than they were assessed. Can you explain why this issue exists and if a problem, what would you do about it? <clears throat> Ms. Snyder? There's a quite a lengthy process that goes into appraising a value to a property. We start with replacement cost, new, less depreciation, and then we take into consideration what the property is, how it's being used, the amenities of it, and the sell prices come into play with the market adjustments that are applied to each neighborhood. So if a property sells for less, then somebody basically got a good deal on it, but we can't, we cannot and do not consider our values or adjust our values to reflect what a property may or may not sell for. I also had that, um, I guess, concern um, given to me uh, throughout my travels on the campaign um, in the different towns that I visited. And I don't think that it's answered necessarily in one way. Um, I think to begin with, uh, there needs to be a pretty lengthy review of, of how the neighborhoods and the land economic areas are stratified. Um, I think um, the way that the land economic areas are currently uh, are restrictive in the sense that they don't allow land to be, to be valued at what its present worth. Um, and on the flip side, uh, I believe that some of the, uh, the neighborhoods may be too inclusive um, which in turn doesn't allow markets to be truly representative of themselves. They kind of, they kind of get bogged down. Um, I know looking through the IAAO regula uh, regulations um, and their procedures, for instances like Hanna, where you have multiple foreclosures happening, in cases where that's how the market is functioning, you're able to take um, that that sale information to use, and I know for a fact since I since I, I did some of the sales verification in the office that those were never taken into into consideration. So it's a multi a multifaceted problem, um, and it's not it's not easily fixed with um, with with just one thing. Fiscal responsibility is becoming more important to the public. What would you change? 
change, would you change anything in the way the department currently budgets? We believe that um, as elected officials, um, there's a higher a higher standard of responsibility that needs to be placed on um, spending the public's money. Um, and taking a look at um, past budgets, uh, the current uh, fiscal budget and the one from last year, uh, I don't think that there are too many things that could be changed. I think uh, things are the way that they need to be. Um, and I'll take it a little bit further and say uh, that some of the budget is exactly the way it has to be. Uh, you know, the, there's just not a whole lot of money there. Um, with any changes, I uh, part of my platform was uh, potentially looking into how other assessors across the state, uh, how their pay scale is for their employees. And they've adopted more of a, a federal type pay scale where it's step and grade. And as I mentioned before, the, the responsibilities of each of the staff, uh, they're specific. Um, and even then, uh, the workload and the difficulty between employee function uh, often are very different. Um, assessor employees must be uh, certified. They're temporarily certified first. Uh, they end up getting uh, their permanent certification, and then they move on and um, you know start to really get into to, to their position. And I think that there needs to be a little bit of more incentive uh, to the employees in that way. I know the current assessor has a really tight budget and when things got really tough in the county a few years ago, she had to make some really difficult decisions in coming up with a, being able to cut the budget even more than what she had. And we essentially lost a person in our office due to the budget cuts. So as far as the budget is, we don't have a lot of money dispersed to the assessor's office or probably any of the many offices because the money wasn't there. But, you know, as Lindsay had said, we in the assessor's office have to get certified and we have to maintain our education and keep our certification so there is a lot of extra expenses in the assessor's office as far as we have to go to school for a week to two weeks a year depending on where we're at in our certifications but Really, there's not a lot of extra money in, I don't think, anybody's budgets. Thank you. Thank you. What changes, what changes do you want to bring into the office to make it more transparent and user-friendly? Renee, would you go first? With anyone that gets into the office, there's going to be changes and transparency has been a huge topic through our whole campaign and i think part of it is the public's not aware of everything that they do have access to in our office anyone can come in call go on our website and get a wide variety of information, but the public's not really aware of what they do have access to as far as you can look at anybody's property assessment, you can look at their tax bills, you can locate parcels and see who owns it and the mailing addresses, and it's, I, I think there needs to be more public education as to what there is that they do have access to. So hopefully we can somehow get the word out that there is a lot more information that you do have access to. Thank you. All right, so changes. Um, I think 
From the time that I spent in the assessor's office, um, I arrived at a few conclusions. And it's not that I think that everything needs to be changed. Uh, I do think there, there is need for change in some areas. Um, as far as office function, um, if I were elected, uh, my office hours would be 8 to 5, period, end of story. That's when the public's allowed in the courthouse. Um, and that's when all of the staff should be there. And while I worked at the assessor's office, um, half of the staff uh, worked 7 to 4. In the county handbook, it states, you know, off county employees shall work 8 to 5 unless otherwise approved by the commission. Um, and so I don't think that's necessarily fair to the public. I know that I worked uh, that 4 to 5 shift by myself many times. I had five, you know, different members of the public come in, and they had to wait. You know, there's only one of me, and I did the best that I could. Um, so, so that would be a change. I also believe that the schedule of the six-year review uh, needs changed as well. Um, from what I, uh, from what I saw when I was there, um, the towns were done first, and the the, the township and ranges um, in proximity to the towns were done along along with them. Um, you know, in, in Wyoming and in Carbon County, you know, as soon as fall hits, it's not really easy to get everywhere in the county. Um, and so I think a uh, focus on um, getting out to the rural township and range properties would be uh, a priority. I know that there, uh, when I did the Pedro Mountains, there were properties that we hadn't even discovered that had been there for years and years and years. And I would, I would say that there are probably still properties out there uh, just like that. Thank you, ladies. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sure. Ladies, I'm uh, curious as to, you have people uh, trained to come out into the field and make assessments of properties? Sure. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so one of the positions in the assessor's office is a field deputy, and that is their, that is their job uh, to go out, and measure, and take the, the property characteristics uh, of the improvement they, they are viewing, and then they in turn bring that back to the office um, to plug into the computer. Uh, so there is a specific position for that. I do think um, the assessor's office, especially on the commercial side of things, I think there's a little bit of a struggle. And I, I think that's just due, due to the lack of, of training. Um, the training isn't there, the education isn't there. And so um, they do the best with what they can, but there's always room for improvement um, on both sides. As Lindsay said, there is a field deputy, and currently I am the field deputy. I am the only one that goes to the field. I go all over Carbon County by myself most of the time, and I do full reviews. I have my paperwork with me as to what we have, and I look for discrepancies. I look for extra buildings, and so I have done a lot of excess training, learning just how to do the field work and go do, be able to do the full reviews and pick up any missing improvements or any issues that I may find on each individual parcel. Well, it's been my observation in the last few years with all of the uh, with all of the uh, technical technical uh, things that are going on, uh, with all of, of our communications technical technical stuff and things, and then we've got the the refinery. How in the world can you guys try to keep up with that? <laughs> I don't think they can keep up with it, honestly. That's a great point. Would you each like to take one minute? As you said, the refinery is a whole different issue, and we are not, we don't feel we have the vast knowledge it would take 
to value that correctly. So the current assessor has a contract with TY Pickett and they specialize in like refineries nationwide and like dew branches and the big massive properties that are in Carbon County, what few there are, we don't have the proper education to value them correctly, so we contract that out to someone that does specialize and stuff like that. Well, that doesn't uh, make me very happy. <laughs> As I said, um, everything industrial in the <coughs> county is valued by um, two by pick at the contract company. Um, and from what the notes that I have taken um, in the budget, there's $47,500 that's spent on the industrial valuation. Um, so that's some food for thought. It would be it would be impossible, I think, for the assessors to try and tackle that on their own. Uh, it's probably more cost effective to hire the company um, to go ahead and, and do it for us. Um, I'm not sure if you have concerns or, or questions on how they do that, um, but um, that's left up to them. That's their specialty. And so maybe well, that would be... Maybe this is off base, but I honestly believe that it would be up to the uh, to the county's advantage to have their own people doing their own work. This bull crap of hiring a, an expert from outside of the state of Wyoming, and then he comes in and tells us, "Well, we can't do this, or we can do this." I want to know from somebody that we have control. So it probably wouldn't make me happier. I told you the contract company was out of Texas. Well, I'm going to talk to the commissioners about it, too. Yeah. And that's, that's absolutely good. The commissioner will tell you that there is a lot of work that will be done with property. Well, I just didn't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is there one additional question from the audience? And then we'll move on to the sheriff candidates. All right. Um, Sir, you raise your hand first. Do we need a mic in there? Yes. I have a question. Um, I know there used to be a chief. Oh, there used to be chief deputy in the assessor's office, and I know that uh, the person had resigned. And uh, I, I get information at home. I am Renee Cousin. Uh, about what goes on in the office, and as a as an outside insider, uh, the question of having a chief deputy. I know it, it costs more money for the county, but as I watch all this, I, I think to myself, if we don't have a chief a chief deputy, if something happens to the assessor or Let's say, you know, God forbid they, have, they get cancer or something like that happens, and there isn't a chief deputy, what will we do? I think, I, I just want to say that I think there should be a chief deputy, and I think the assessor and the chief deputy should be sitting right where they are right now. I think they are. Okay, do you have a question? Or. My question is, do, you, do these two, do both of them, would they try to get a chief deputy? And to the commissioner, can they afford it? Okay. Lindsay, can you go first? Uh, I guess the question on, you know, if something happened to the assessor, what would happen? Um, you know, what would the office do at that point? Three people that can be put forward for, for the commission to then um, fill that. I think I, I think that's how it goes. The commission would then appoint somebody to to finish to finish out the term. Now, my belief on whether there needs to be a chief deputy or not, I, I think that it's helpful. I think that it's helpful in instances where the assessor is not in the office. I think the public feels. Um, a little more at ease when they talk to somebody who who has a little bit more vast knowledge of, of the entirety of the office function as opposed to just what they do. Um, 
it's kind of you know your second in command, um, your your vice president, if you will. Um, and so I think that the loss of that that kind of my understanding as far as the chief deputy would be someone who would kind of fall it next in line, the assessor should be training the chief deputy to be able to maybe possibly one day take over her role or his role when they would retire. And as Lindsay said, you know, if something, if the assessor's gone for meetings or vacation, whatever, then there would be someone there for second in command to kind of field any issues that would come up because as for now when our assessor's gone we're kind of you know stuck out there and if something comes up that because we each specialize in one area if something comes up we have to tell people you know I'm sorry but we don't know the answer to that question you'll have to wait till she comes back Aaron, did you have a question? Just really quickly, uh, Byron Barkers. I just had a, a quick two-fold question about your field. Um, did you say that he's a, is that a, what, what's the classification? Your field deputy? Field deputy? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, would it help to have another field deputy? And also then, is it something that is um, constantly ongoing all year round, and then you try to get back to each individual property every six years? Or are you trying to do the entire thing every six years? And the reason I ask is, um, being in the real estate, I often see discrepancies on square footage and things like that. And so I imagine the, the uh, enormity of the, you know, the task at hand, uh, if it would be helpful to have another deputy. Thank you. Okay. Aaron, I have a question for you. Um, as I stated earlier, I am the only person in the office as a field deputy that goes to the field. There's another lady in the office that's not health-wise able to go out into the field, so she does part of the computer work, where I go do all the leg work. And yes, we do need another field deputy that can go to the field because I go to the rural stuff a lot of times by myself, and as a woman out there, you know, you never know where you're going to have an issue. And with Harvey County not having the best cell phone service, you know, it kind of poses some issues. But yeah, we definitely need another field deputy. And how it works is we're required by the state to visit each parcel in Harvey County every six years. And where a lot of the square footages come into play that are incorrect. I don't know how they measured them, when they measured them back years ago, but I find a lot of the times the square footage and improvement information is not correct. I would agree that having um, at least two field deputies um, would be helpful in, in getting to every single property in the county. That's that's how uh, that statute's worded. You're supposed to hit every single property um, at least once in a six-year period. Um, so it's not having to go visit the whole county in, in one year. It's every six years. Uh, I think in the past, uh, the assessor had added um, the sales reviews uh, to that number, which I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, you know, if you have, uh, we'll just make it, we'll make it easy. You have 6,000 properties you have to review in a, in a six year period. Uh, you add uh, 500 sales to that. Uh, I think it kind of muddles, uh, muddles the numbers a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, but uh, while Carbon County is spread out, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of time uh, spent traveling just to get to the far reaching areas of the county. and. I would say that it's probably almost impossible for one person to get uh, all properties reviewed in, in a timely and 
uh, state appreciated fashion. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> and it's, um, I guess you're done. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for providing me this opportunity to share my recent goals, my future goals. Time to share. I'd like to thank my wife, Angie, teacher, been with her for 27 years, my daughter, Olivia, she's an UW graduate, and my son, Ryan, he's a UW student. I've been employed with the sheriff's office for 29 years and worked with three sheriffs. Speaking of which, there's one here. <laughs> My goals are to serve and protect the citizens of Carbon County to the best of my ability, provide staff with technology and technical training, obtain a drone to assist in critical situations, become more proactive with livestock investigations, add a second canine, remain fiscal diverse and conservative, assist in school safety issues, implement a school resource officer, county wide, continue the DARE program, aid in school and safety drills and to continue to assist with health security issues. Since January of 2018, I have, with the assistance of the commissioners, been able to obtain staff raises, fill vacant deputy positions, provide new and protective, protective vests and body cameras for officers, purchase new tasers, the drug seizure one, establish a drone policy for search and rescue, uh, new portables for uh, um, our deputies through the home and security grant. Implement a sex offender sex offender program. Also approve a new 911 system. Dual purpose canine and equipment. Utilize that in the drug seizure line. Obtain new jail cameras. Provide a power shift for better coverage. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe okay. you'll look at some additional questions, but consider. Okay. Yeah, whichever one you'd like to use. Good evening, and thank you for letting us be here. All I have to say is thank God this is the last one. <laughs> um, Walter Hagen, and I'm really short about a few things. I've been in law enforcement for 27 years, uh, a few years ago. 15 years with Robinson Police Department and 10 years with uh, Sheriff's Office. I'm going to skip a lot of the Married to My Wife and Dad book. I've been that for 35 plus years. We do have two kids, um, both in Casper and three grandkids. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, how's this there? Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the things that uh, when I was with the Sheriff's Office that we tried to get was more equipment. Um, we'd go in and we'd ask for radars, uh, camera systems, and even computers. Because found out that we're working the counties around us, they had all this fine money clear. We were always we we're always told that there was no money in the budget. And the reason I'm jumping on this is because of the time we did. That's incorrect. I actually talked to the commissioner. There's a few things I wanted to ask him. And sheriff never went and asked for this stuff. So when we were told, they never asked for it. The equipment we have, the radars they have now, are secondhand. To be honest with you, I'm sick and tired of Carver County having to go after secondhand stuff. Or, in the situation we have now, um, and I'm not going to, it's kind of a sensitive subject, but uh, there's equipment that's being remodified from the Ross Police Department for the deputies that shouldn't be. The, web, the, the information, the stuff they have, is too sensitive to be having remodified 
for the equipment they have. It's just not, I'm trying to be nice here, it's, it's, um, it's not appropriate. Um, so I'm really tired of carbon county having to go second hand stuff all the time. Uh, yeah, did the commissioner say that there's no money? Sometimes, but this last budget, 16, 7, 17, 18, they turned back 200 health okay. dollars. So how can you not tell me that? What are your thoughts on centralized dispatch for Carbon County, as well as the possibility of contracting law enforcement services to the municipalities? Do you see Carbon County? Do you see Carbon County Sheriff one day providing all law enforcement in the county? Um, Walter, please go first. Okay, you're talking about dispatch system, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, when I first started, that was one of my goals, and actually, I contacted Albany. Sweetwater and the trunk. Uh, I spoke with all of their uh, public communication officers, or the ones who would be in charge, and we, I sent them a questionnaire of 13 questions. I actually went and visited two of them, and it does turn out that yes, in the, in the short term, it does cost more to get the building, to get the communication system up and running. But after that, then well, it, it, what's nice about it is one, retaining dispatchers. Every, everyone I talked to said they never go back to a one dispatch center because you retain your dispatchers more. You're able to pay them more. The other thing is equipment. You're not, if we have three dispatch centers in this county, you're not upgrading for each one. So all the money's go to that. Uh, they said, everyone that I talked to said the hardest part of getting a dispatch center was convincing the egos of the people in those areas. But I talked to all the surrounding areas, they're all for it. They want to push for it. Um, the other thing for it is that when you get a command one dispatch center, then when you get a call to it, it doesn't have to be relayed. So you are, if you're looking for saving lives, then yes, if you get that in, they can dispatch it right away. And there's also how you pay for it. It's, Depending on each each county has its different ways. Sweetwater's I like. Uh, they have their set up where each obviously the, the two big cities and the county, they're the biggest ones. So they pay a portion depending on their calls of service, and that refers to law enforcement and fire and rescue and ambulance. So okay. but it is a great idea actually. Okay, first part of that question as far as contracting for the 911. That is a big decision that not only as a sheriff, the commissioners, the city councilmen, that everyone needs to realize that this is not just a single single answer. Everybody has to be in it and everybody has to be for it. There's something, as far as what Mr. Hagen was talking about, uh, there's a lot of entities that go into making this work. It's not just something that we can go ahead and do. Um, two years ago, we went to the Rollins Police Department and we made a, uh, we were thinking about updating our 911 system at that point. Well, for the money that they wanted us to join them, we decided to go and uh, look at that because we would have to update our equipment. So what we did was we started looking around and we did this new Gen 911 system that we've been able to utilize. It's going to be beneficial for us and you the citizens for at least another 10 years. Because with this call works, what they're going to do is they're going to provide us with uh, equipment for the next 10 years. During that period of time, there may be more uh, discussions pertaining to the 911 system. Right now, there are three us, the Rawls Police Department, and the Saratoga Police Department. But, um, you know, as time goes on, we right now, our agency dispatches for 25 different entities. So, um, as far as the 911 goes, it's going to be something that has to be done throughout the whole county with everybody's teamwork and effort and making sure that we involve everybody. 
As far as the law enforcement goes, for small communities, right now, as everybody knows. Sorry, thank you. Oh, <laughs> so, if the audience is here, they'll be okay to have questions if they are interested. This is in actually not fair on this. I mean, we need to have a little bit of a rebuttal. Just a second. I have a 30 seconds. Okay. Fair? I think um, maybe in closing arguments, you know, maybe I'll give you an opportunity at the end. I think you guys can address the audience and have a rebuttal. And we'll give you two minutes. So, why don't you know, sort of make some comments and, and do that. So. I am open. Okay, great. Medicine Bow is supposed to receive $1.9 million in the next year from impact assistant monies, which they stated they would use for police department. How does this funding affect your plans for providing law enforcement in the Medicine Bow area? And Mr. Roybal, let's go first. Okay, concerning that $1.9 million that they've been able to obtain, uh, a lot of you don't know, but I went ahead and sent a letter reference to the town of Medicine Bow and advise them that we would help them any way we could, whether it be dispatch, whether it be with the vehicle or whatever we could. At that point, um, with this funds, they said that they needed some money to obtain a police department. Um, I want to say the last forum, I sent the town of Medicine Bow actually a text requesting what their plan was and what they were planning to do with that money. And they said basically they didn't have an idea at that time. So as far as us and our um, ability, you know, we have incorporated a power shift, which is an individual working from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. So that, that individual is out trying to assist these agencies. But like I said before, um, Medicine Bowl area, we have one full time individual up there in Elk Mountain. And what we're doing right now is we're having other deputies respond to those locations and work those areas during their shift. So, with that money, I have yet to see what they've actually been able to do. Um, I know that uh, the commissioners have allowed us to get two individuals, and hopefully, um, we'll see what happens. But I got two, they've allowed us to have two in detention facility and also two on the street. So I believe that uh, up until this day I haven't heard anything from the single. Okay. And actually like, honestly this is the first I've heard about the 1.9 million. Uh, we've had discussions about having a coverage in those areas. Uh, I agree medicine bowl they're going to get this money should and they can talk about it before that they should have their own police department the fact is the police department then is for medicine bowl a county deputy is still responsible the county sheriff is still responsible for the county surrounding those areas and so we should have i'm not a big fan of, of, of doing rotations i'm a big fan of having a deputy station in those areas because then they become familiar with those areas they become uh, very acquainted with the people there, and it makes a big difference, especially in trust. Um, if you have people going and coming to all the time, it, it's kind of hard to get trust. Um, and then if you have one midnight shift, they don't see the people. So you have a deputy in those areas, and they're not just patrolling the end that is well, or in Hannah, as a police department, but they're still patrolling those areas, but they're patrolling in the whole area. So they need to be. Uh, Canada, Elk Mountain, Arlington, and what we haven't mentioned, Arlington. we do have citizens in Carbon County who live in Arlington. So we do need to have people patrolling in those areas. So I am a firm believer in deputies in those areas stationed there. Um, and it's great that, that Medicine Bowl is going to get this. I was all small communities to get 1.9 million and start a police department. But again, it's something that if I get elected, we will work with, we will do our best to help them out. But the fact is that definitely will be stationed eventually, not right off where people said he's going to tear people's families apart. Not going to happen. Um, we will look at it, we will end up going, and we will eventually get people stationed over there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Kate. Okay. I'd like to start with Mr. Hagan, but this is for both of you. Do you speak Spanish? No, 
None at all? Oh, a little bit. Do you, okay. Can you hold up for me? Thank you. My hands don't work very well. Uh, do you know how many employees of the current, current sheriff's office staff speak Spanish? Uh, when I was there, there was two. So I don't know. I know one of them still there. I don't know if the other one is still there. Uh, how interested are you in improving that and improving cultural literacy on the part of your staff members? And are you personally comfortable code switching between white, English-speaking, ordinary, whatever you consider the norm is, and dealing with families and people who have had to learn English as a second language and many of them don't even have that? How comfortable are you with that? How would you behave in that kind of situation? Are you talking about being you know, yes. interacting? As a, as a sheriff, and what would you expect from your employees? Well, I've interacted with them from different languages. Mm -hmm. Some of them, we have to get interpreters here. So it's going to happen. We're a diverse country here. So you, have I learned to speak Spanish? No, my dad is fluent in it. Um, but I can think, pick up a few words and stuff. Uh, but when I deal with people, if I can't, I'm pretty good at using your hands, and I'm sure a lot of you can, can kind of communicate with people that have different languages. But the bottom line, if I have to have somebody, I will find somebody. I've done it before. Um, if I arrest somebody, yeah, and it's very simple. They understand arrest. So you take them in, and you get somebody who does interpretation, just like in the courts. The courts get somebody who uh, can interpret whatever the procedures are. So it's the same thing that people I've worked with. Um, it's to make, I'm not going to say you know, we're not going to go out there and tell all the sheriff deputies they can learn Spanish because there are so many different people out there of different languages and another thing is you found out there's different dialects of Spanish that are completely different than when you're talking with people so the best thing to do I, I've dealt with uh, people of all religions all races uh, get along with them well, if they're, and depends on how bad they are, because I'm always one of those that, look, you know, I'll teach you really nice, but if you step over the line, then I'm not a nice guy. Uh, and I'll treat you how you treat me. So the bottom line is we treat everybody how we want to be treated, okay? It um, doesn't matter. Not, and the illegal thing is a big thing now, but the fact is, if, if and I've done it, uh, I've stopped people, they're illegal. They speak no Spanish, they're not here legally, I mean they're here legally, no driver's license stuff, and they go to jail. It's not for me to make those laws. Um, it's immigration that does that. They get to the jail, the jail has a protocol where they call uh, immigration and they do. But speaking with them, we do well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Hello. Okay. I believe there's three individuals that speak Spanish that I've found. Me, one. Um, I'm not very, my mom and dad are Spanish, and so uh, I grew up with it, I know how to talk it. Um, and I'm not, uh, I used to, years ago, uh, translate for the court. The problem with that was, is when we were doing Miranda, there were some of the words that I could not, I couldn't do it completely. So I didn't do it. So then I called my dad and he would do it, or my mom would do it. So, of course, but, uh, so apparently there's, there's, like I said, three individuals right now that speak Spanish. Um, I would have to agree with Mr. Hagan. There are a lot of people out there that have different uh, nationalities, but regardless of what they are, they're going to treat with respect and dignity. And if they violate the law, then that's what we're going to do is get to enforce the law. So um, I believe the integrity of the department. It's always been strong. Uh, that's why a lot of people go to the sheriff's office because they feel that they're safe and that they are treated with respect. And just for both of you guys, the uh, Law Enforcement Academy in Douglas has a law enforcement Spanish class they offer every now and then, and it's really good. Thank you, Kate. Mr. Hicks. <laughs> run, Sue, run. <laughs> Quick question for the candidates. Uh, due to fiscal constraints with the state of Wyoming, uh, we significantly reduced the number of livestock investigators. Um, <clears throat> the importance of the livestock industry in this county can't be understated. 
a um, couple of the solutions that have been kicked around. And I'd like to get to more opinion. Would the sheriff's department be willing, number one, and two, capable of consuming the role of the investigators for livestock theft and also enforcement of Wyoming brand law? Okay, Archie. Good question. Um, and that's actually one of my uh, concerns is livestock investigations do in fact there is very there's I believe there's one investigator now throughout the state. So uh, a few months ago in Cheyenne I was at a Sheriff's and Chiefs Association, that was one of the questions that were there posed how are the counties going to uh, assist each other in working with investigations as far as livestock. Um, there was a couple options that were, were issued out there. They have an individual, uh, I don't know, in uh, Natoma County, they had an individual that was just a deputy that was designated as a livestock investigator. He's recently passed, but there are others in other counties. So I guess my, my uh, concern would be to one, if not be able to provide an investigator, I think it's a very, a very big issue, and uh, that issue is is a, an area that we would like to explore. But finding the right individual might be a problem at this point. But not to say something down the road. In addition to that, as far as the enforcement of brands, uh, I would have to uh, take a look at that because. I would like to see uh, us work more with the brand inspectors. And I know a lot of those are, are becoming few and far between. So I know some of the options that they had were to possibly get with, uh, maybe have one deputy or two deputies within the state and have an MOU with them in order to be able to cross into different areas to help with that livestock investigation. So, Am I open to it? I have to say yes, as far as uh, finding the right individual and uh, making sure that uh, producers and everybody involved would uh, have some options. Okay, Archie. Uh, the investigation, yes, I'm a firm believer in. Doing investigations to end in certain traffic, uh, concerning livestock. And one of the things we've we've had training with the brand inspectors concerning how to determine and how to stop them. And we had the brand books and everything else. Now, one of the things that we were told in these classes that we don't have to um, we don't need probable cause to pull over a trailer full of livestock. If if you have deputies doing this. If you train them and say, okay, I want you guys to be doing this, you see, see a, a trailer being pulled by uh, pulled by a truck, pull it over, check the paper. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is that um, we don't have that. And I know there's going to be some disagreement, but the guys are not out there doing traffic. And you're going to see, there's going to be part where they say, why not? I have no idea. I'm a traffic person. I am the person that if you're not doing anything, get out there. You don't have to be stopping, but if you see when it comes to livestock, the investigation, you need to be stopping these vehicles. Now, when it comes to investigation, if you have somebody who's a good investigator, you just can't say, okay, we're all investigators because that is incorrect. You have to have a passion for it, and you have to have some knowledge. So somebody who's going out investigating crimes can investigate livestock the same way it is a crime. If it's a theft, Investigate the same way. So it doesn't have to be a special person about who knows about livestock. It's great to have them. But somebody who's a very good investigator can investigate livestock crime just as it can do a domestic or a aggravated assault because it boils down to the knowledge that you have as an investigator how far you've written. But I, I believe it, that we can work together on that. That's a good idea. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, what, if any, changes would be implemented to make sure that the officers follow up with the public after initial reports are being made? 
Mr. Hagan. When I was with the Sheriff's Department, even the Police Department, uh, we, the Police Department, we, uh, we had a case, you had to, because on the computer, it would pop up. So we would follow up with whoever our victims or um, who our RP was, the reporting person concerning the case. Sheriff's Office, when I had a case, uh, no matter how it went, if it was from a minor to a major, I would always call them back. When I train people, I always emphasize you need to call the people back because if you don't, <coughs> or down the road, if you say, hey, what happened to my case? The bottom line is if I'm in, then I will implement that if you're working a case, you will stay in contact with those people. Now, who the person is, now with the victims, we do have victims and uh, activists, um, and, and they are the ones who stay with the victims concerning a major crime. But if it's a, a minor crime, a theft, where they're not involved, uh, it's still up to the deputies to contact these people. Even if, if they get to the point where they say, you know, I've gone as far as I can, I'm going to have to close this and until something else pops up. And if it does, then I will let you know. Something simple as that makes those people feel a lot better about, okay, at least he tried. But if you never hear from them, then they're thinking they just brushed me off. And I've, I've had different things I've talked to, so I don't want you to call these people, right? Because I'm, I'm very, it's the, it's the public who is out there, they depend on us. And for us to earn their respect and keep their respect, then we have to make sure, because we work for you, you don't work for us. And so as 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 department, we need to make sure that the people out there are comfortable still with us and can rely on us as deputies uh, to do our job and to make sure they're always informed. Okay. okay. Good question. In fact, um, I had an individual call me and say that I had a deputy uh, last week that needed to call them and inform them of the case. So what I did is I just put out a friendly reminder on the computer, basically telling our deputies to make sure that they contact the individual reporting party or the victims that actually uh, um, have reported that to them. So we're, uh, we're always trying to get better. And uh, like I said, I had an individual call me last week and I put out a uh, notification to make sure that that happens. Uh, as far as the command staff goes, I've told the command staff that they need to make sure that that's happening. So, thank you. Good question. Are there any other questions? I did promise a two minute closing argument. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Hagan. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. First off, I want to thank again everybody for showing up. Thank you. Great monitor. A um, couple of things that I'm not going to rattle on, but with, when he was talking about the 911 system, uh, vest, tasers, and stuff, a lot of this equipment is equipment that has to be replaced. It's not, you know, if it's new, great, but it has to be replaced. It's like anything, like you guys at home, you have equipment, and it starts wearing out. It has a shelf life. So the accomplishment to me would be actually, I guess, a, a 911 or a uh, combined uh, dispatch center and, and actually using the fund to start purchasing new equipment instead of getting equipment from other departments. And uh, it, it is frustrating with that. And now let's talk about the canine real quick. He brought up the canine, let's get to that one. What's irritating is when our last one was uh, our debate or forum in certain moments was we talked about cases. This year, the Charlie County Sheriff's Office had uh, five drug cases per case. That's what they were expected to give it to. Um, if you have a canine unit, why would you get another one if you're not going to allow this canine unit? You just got it. I hope they get to use it because I-80 is what? It's the drug corridor. We have drugs coming in all the time. If you don't let your deputies out there doing traffic stops and teach them what to look for, because that's how. Those cases get turned over to another agency, which is DCI, if they have to, because a lot of this is the, uh, going across state lines, county lines that we can't work, and they can do it. So 
it's nice to have a canine unit, but if, if you're not going to allow the canine unit and the deputies out there to do their job when they haven't, you know, when they're not doing something else, uh, then it, it, it's defeating the whole purpose of, of saying keeping the drugs out of this county. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, let me see here where I can start with my rebuttal. As far as the equipment goes, we obtained uh, brand new vests. And the way we obtained those was through a grant, uh, a grant for that. As far as equipment goes, the only thing that we've been able to, and since we work well with other agencies, is obtain tasers for the detention officers. Those individuals didn't have one, so what we did is we purchased brand new ones with the drug seizure money that we have utilized, so it didn't cost anything. So what we had to do is, what I decided to do is go ahead and get with the Ross Police Department and get their old tasers for our detention officers so that every officer would have one. So, and in addition to the canine, uh, that canine, what we've had is my goal is to have two of them, one in uh, the bags area, because I-80 isn't always the, the corridor for uh, drugs. You have a lot of individuals on 789, 287, 487 in our county that are coming in. They're not using the highways, they're using the back roads. So that, in a sense, I don't know. Um, but anyway, as far as the K-9 goes, we are going to utilize it. We purchased the canine with drug seizure money, it didn't cost the same. I also got a, a, a Tahoe that we equipped with the canine before the canine. It didn't cost the same. So these are things that we're using, different ideas out of the box in order to get the equipment, to get the uh, individuals trained, and it's not costing the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, the state senate candidates in district 11, Senator Larry Hicks and his challenger Leanne Stevenson. And while they're coming up here, I'll take a commercial break and uh, thank the Saratoga Sun and Josh Wood very much for doing our Facebook stream. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. of Senate District 11 expect from Senator Larry Hicks? Thank you, Sue, and those members of Senate District 11 that are here tonight. Uh, what I'd really like to do tonight is just have a little honest conversation with you about the future of Wyoming, and our culture, our values, are at stake in this election, for both the state of Wyoming the nation. The contrast between myself and my opponent are stark. Um, I'm a fiscal conservative and a Ronald Reagan Republican. And my opponent's a liberal Democrat who voted for Obama and Hillary Clinton. I think it's important when we talk about the future of the state of Wyoming and the reality of the fiscal state that we're in. Is the simple fact is, is the state of Wyoming has a $500 million structural deficit in the budget. And what that means is, is we're spending more money than we actually took in. So the reality is, is when we look at the future of Wyoming and we talk about government spending, I voted against every tax increase in the state of Wyoming in the legislature. And my opponent has stated publicly that she wants to increase taxes multitude of spending for social programs. The real, fiscal reality is the state of Wyoming is it's 
absolutely impossible to increase government spending without increasing your taxes. $500 million structural deficit in the budget that we passed last year. So you have a choice. More government, more spending, and more taxing. Smaller government, limited taxes, and more liberties. I'll tell you, nobody's fought hard enough in the state of Wyoming for your God given and your constitutional rights. And I have in the Wyoming Senate. I'm endorsed by the NRA. I've sponsored every major piece of Second Amendment right legislation in the last six years. Five pieces of major legislation protecting private property rights that Hi. I've sponsored or co sponsored. Thank you. Thank you. If elected, what can the residents of Senate District 11 expect, expect from Senator Leanne Stevenson? This one? Yeah. Um, good evening. Uh, one of the things that you can expect from me is to listen to my constituents. Um, my goal has been to understand the concerns and the issues and the problems that affect Senate District 11 and to take them to shine. Um, I've attended uh, most all of the uh, town hall meetings and, uh, across this district and listened to the concerns of the people of the smaller towns. And it's amazing how many similarities we have across uh, our area. Um, we talk about law enforcement and we talk about taxes when we talk about um, the, the many burdens that are put on um, by state government on our small rural communities. Some of these uh, burdens are, are very large. So my plan is to continue to meet with uh, my district, to meet with the towns uh, and to take their concerns and their needs forward to Cheyenne. Thank you. Local government funding. Please tell us what your ideas are concerning this issue. And recently there has been some discussion by the municipalities of allowing them to place additional sales tax via a vote within their municipal boundaries. Could you please tell us what your ideas are on local government funding and if you would agree with this option for municipalities? And I'll ask uh, Leanne to go first, please. Well, um, I really feel that vote control is very important. However, um, for instance, sales tax in some of our communities in Riverside County, too, that's not going to be very much money. I would like to see um, a, an even or uh, a better distribution of the funds from the state to the small communities. But I also feel local control is very important. So. Um, the option of having local municipalities to raise taxes should be up to that local municipality. Senator. Yeah, currently the state of Wyoming distributes 105 million to cities, towns, and counties. Senate District 11 has 13 municipalities and three counties. I've always fully supported the appropriations from the state of Wyoming to cities, towns, and counties, and we'll continue to do so as we move forward. One of the things that we need to look at, rural areas, we have 13 municipalities in Senate District 11, we're all within the average population of the rest of, the, the rest of those municipalities is ranges about 400. So we need to look at the sales tax redistribution on how that's partitioned between the state and the local governments. I support things like get penny because they go to you, the voters. So if any taxes that are going to be passed need to go to the voters for ratification. One of the things that's been brought up is this, a little bit of more local control, which I've always supported, whether it's the tax going back on the groceries, but that really doesn't help a town like Medicine Bow when you got one convenience store. Very difficult. So we need to relook at the tax distribution of the way we currently. So it's split on the sales tax right now. I think there's other options to allow a six pennies tax for those local issues to go on the ballot and not cap those. The trouble with the fifth penny taxes is it is, a, it is specifically purposes only for what that can be 
infrastructure. And a lot of times it's not infrastructure in small communities, it may be law enforcement, it may be your water treatment plant, maybe an ordinance officer or just support for that town. So I think those are things that the legislature can do and will do. I'm committed to work and always have been to our rural communities in Central District of Idaho. Follow up on the sales tax and the tax question. It has been said that a sales tax is the lazy man's way to raise money. What is your feeling on that has been discussed as one of the options? And I will start with you, Senator Hicks, on that one. Actually, I think the sales tax is the most fundamentally fair tax because everybody pays in a proportion to how much you spend. So across all sectors, they should really get taxed. I think property taxes are a very regressive tax because they only target a few. Some of the other taxes, so in my opinion, the sales tax is probably one of the most powerful because everybody that buys something pays into it and it is proportional to the amount of money that you actually spend. Yeah. I think that sales tax is the most regressive tax. Um, people on the lower income pay a lot higher percentage of their income in sales tax. I would like to see a visit of some issues concerning property tax. One concern that we have, or that I have, is we have a lot of um, non-resident property owners, for instance, in our community, who still have to have water, sewer, streets, police protection. And, uh, but yet they're not contributing sales tax. They're not, they don't live here, they're not, they're not here on a regular basis. So I would like to see if we were going to look at um, taxes on property, I would like to see a different rate system for non-resident property owners. So, uh, yes, you can follow up with that. Yeah. And then Leanne, you'll get it. Just one other thing on the sales tax as far as being the lazy man's tax. So if you understand the economy in Wyoming, the number two economic driver in the state of Wyoming is tourism. When you have sales tax, all of those people that come in and use your goods and services in your local communities and your counties actually pay into the system. So again, I think the sales tax across all the economic sectors all economic arenas that you deal with are absolutely probably if we were going to look at taxes because we get that number two industry sector in the state of Wyoming is probably the most fair tax and the best tax if there was an increase in the state of Wyoming. Again, I do support the local option to go on the ballot for that purpose. Leanne, you want to follow up on that? I don't really have anything else to say about it. <laughs> I think I said it. All right. The big issue that we're probably either tired of listening to or hoping will go away is education and education funding. And I would ask what your thoughts and ideas are on this issue and what some of your solutions might be. And I'll let Leanne start with that first. Um, education, quality education in the state of, state of Wyoming is, is very, very important and it's actually in our constitution. Um, I feel that there were some, some explorations of funding for education that was, came out of the, the House last year with Representative, Representative Harshman and um, had some great, great ideas that got shut down in the Senate. One of the things I would like to do is to um, work across both in the House and across the Senate and look at all solutions and then also take forth the solutions from the five uh, school districts that we have in, in District 11 because my number one um, focus is to serve this district and I would, I would take the information from our local school districts to Cheyenne. Senator Hicks. So as we stand today when I talked about a 500 million dollar structural deficit K-12 education, when we get to Cheyenne in a year and a half of now, is looking at a $200 million shortfall on K-12 at the current rate. We spend $1.6 billion per biennium on K-12 education. 
which is equivalent to 88,000 students in the state of Wyoming and about $17,000 per student per year. The current funding mechanism, if we don't see an uptick, uptick in our revenue supply is unsustainable. So how are we going to grab that? Right now, I've worked for the last year, I've got a piece of legislation. We have 106,000 acres of school trust lands that are supposed to derive revenue to fund our K-12 system that are landlocked in federal lands. In other words, we have wilderness areas, wilderness study areas, roadless areas. And these lands were gifted to the state of Wyoming that are an act of admission to derive revenue for our K-12 system. We have 106,000 acres that we cannot get to. Based on the state geologist information, we estimate that there's somewhere in a billion dollars plus in mineral wealth locked up in those federal parcels. So one of the issues that I've worked on for two years that we have legislation for in this year is to start to look at, at doing major land swap with the federal government to get those schools trust sections out of those landlocked parcels so they can start doing what they were gifted to the state of Wyoming under our active admission. One thing, that's the revenue side. The other thing that we need to do is we need to start looking at the recreational component. If you are in the livestock business, the timber business, or the minerals business, you pay those royalties to the state of Wyoming. We also start having to look at recreation and utilize those school trust lands because they are for one purpose only. The fiduciary responsibility of the state of Wyoming is to derive revenue for the K-12 education system. So we need to start looking at recreational use of those also. A very partisan political question. What is your thoughts on changing the law in Wyoming to allow for open primary elections? And I'll start with you, Senator Hicks, on that. Absolutely not. And here's why. A primary election is for one purpose. And that's for you and your party. Whatever party you want to, to go to the general election. I won't support open election in the neighborhood because that's the first step towards the destruction of our democracy when we no longer have the ability for you as a group of people who have common values and common themes to get together and pick the candidate that you want to put before the people. So I do not support open elections. In fact, I further would like to see us change our election laws. I've co-sponsored legislation in the past it would restrict an individual's ability to change your voter registration at the poll because the primary elections are for you Republicans and you Democrats to pick your candidate to run against each other in a general election. And that is why we run primary elections and we should not believe that in our political system. States that have done that, you can look at them, they're a disaster. Leah. Um, I think that the system that we have currently is, is correct, and I wouldn't make any changes in the primary system that we have. Um, uh, I think I'm, I'm not that open, I'm not supportive of open primaries though either. Um, I think that the way that we have set up now is the honest way to, to go forward. A follow up on that would be. Would you still leave it the same so that parties could be changed at the elections as they currently are? And I'll um, start with you on that one, Leanne. Yes, I would leave them currently as it is now. You can change when you uh, register. Senator Hayes. I think I already answered that question. I have in the past and will continue to support legislation that, that you cannot change voter registration in the primary elections and then switch back. I think that's wrong. Again, there is a purpose for primary elections. And it's not to gerrymander, it's not to jump parties, it's not to monkey wrench, it's not to try to influence what the other party wants to do as far as picking their individual to run in a general election. So. Okay, thank you. And my last really political question. State statute defines the duties of county commissioners, county sheriffs, county assessors, county clerks, County treasurers, county attorneys. These are partisan positions currently, Democrat and Republican. Would you consider legislation to remove the partisan?
partisan issue with county government officials, though they're somewhat along the lines of town government officials. And Leanne, I'll let you go first on that. Um, yes. <laughs> That's a simple answer. Um, some of those positions need to be uh, nonpartisan, particularly when you look at a sheriff's uh, sheriff department, where they need to be responsive to their community, and uh, excuse me, not to a particular party or a party philosophy. So um, I I would entertain looking at those positions as being nonpartisan. Senator. You know, I've never been a lover, kind of a spoiler on these, and, and I do think that in some instances that we should get rid of party affiliations because it's really not about politics, it's about good government. And in those positions, we need to eliminate that. On other ones, when you're spending taxpayer dollars, absolutely. We should have partisan elections on those particular things. Because that's the only way that we can be responsible to those taxpayers. Sheriffs, I think, ought to be a, a nonpartisan assessor, probably nonpartisan county commissioners. I think they need to remain and should remain as partisan uh, positions. But you're dealing with taxpayer dollars. Thank you. And I have one more, and then we'll open them up to the audience. A survey of state employees was recently done, which so which showed very low morale. The results of this survey were publicized from those employed at UW more than the other departments. What do you think the legislature could do to assist in alleviating the low morale and turnover of state employees in their particular departments? And I'll start with Senator Hicks on that one, please. You know, having somebody that spent a lot of time working with government, anytime you reduce budgets, morale is pretty low. It's pretty low for elected officials that have to do the hard job, too. But when it comes to the university, you know, the problem with the university we have right now. And we've seen some substantial progress with the university. But we've had a university for quite some years, and until the last three or four years, we've had a board of trustees that really did, in my opinion, step up and do their job. The board's doing a good job right now. Low faculty morale in the University of Wyoming is a byproduct of the conservative nature of the state of Wyoming. And quite frankly, for too long, the university has taken a very liberal left bend claiming academic freedom is more important than teaching our use of the values of the culture of Wyoming and our history. So I understand that there's a poor morale there, but the simple fact is that I think that's being addressed through the trustees. We've got a good president right now. I think we're on the right track at the university. We just need to keep down that track. But it is a low morale situation. But that's not going to correct itself by throwing money at the university of Wyoming. Thank you. Leah? Um, well, some of you may know that I was a state employee for six, 26 years. Um, I worked at the Department of Family Services, and while I was there, we had a similar um, study about turnover. Um, one of the first uh, and probably shocking things that came out of that study, that was a legislative study, um, was that money was not the number one reason why, why staff were leaving. That number one lead reason was they didn't feel supported. Um, the the support in within the an agency such as Department of Family Services or the Attorney General's Office, or Department of Health, comes from the top down, from the director uh, appointed by the governor down through the agency, and uh, making sure that our staff are well trained, well supported is the most important. Uh, we've got, I can't remember the exact number, I think 38 openings right now at the prison, for instance. Um, those are highly trained positions. Um, but what we can do to recruit people that are wanting and willing to come to Rollins is very important, but also to make sure that they're supported um, when they get there. Thank you. I will open it up to audience questions. Anybody have any questions for the Senate candidates? Um, Mr. Sherrod, I'll let you go first. Let 
Kathy. Larry, I'm a retired uh, state employee, and I've, and I've been a retired state employee for about 20 years now. When I uh, left the state service, uh, I was told that there were several billion dollars in the bank belonging to the state of Wyoming. Uh, what the hell happened to that? All of a sudden, we're, we're having to raise all the taxes across the state of Wyoming. And what is that money still there, number one? Number two, uh, is it being spent wisely? You know, I feel that uh, uh, the state of Wyoming has, with their construction project down there, has really upset me because here they are uh, raising my license plates almost double from what they were so that they could have uh, four or five different uh, buildings being uh, remodeled, and uh, I don't see where it's necessary. Can't they do what everybody else does? Buy as you pay, or uh, pay as you buy. You know, it's it's. Uh, I'm really upset with the situation, and, and I know there are a lot of other people too. Senator Hicks, you can take about a minute or so to answer that. Yeah, so it, it, it may shock some of you. But I'm on the same retirement plan that you are because the legislature a few years ago required every local government to participate in the state's retirement plan to help try to avoid that. So right now there's seven billion, several billion dollars in the pension plan. That's invested by the, the Secretary of the Treasurer's Office. They invest those in a whole myriad of funds. If we look at where we're at right now with our pension, it's 85%, 80 to 85% actuarially sound. In other words, we got $8 for every $10 that we, we promised. So one of the problems that happens is, is, is that you and myself are, are, are the baby boomers, we're a little longer, so we're pulling retirement out for a lot longer than it's historically projected life expectancy. So that's why we're no longer actuarially sound. So what we've tried to do in the legislature in the last few years and in fact, at one point in time, we put an additional $30 million in there after the financial crisis of 2008, when we actually lost money, the state took general fund money to put back in there to try to raise that, so we were more actuarially sound. We raised Hi. the retirement age for new individuals coming in there, Hi. and increased the requirement for employers to put more in there towards that pension and retirement fund. Thank you, Leanne. Do you have a response? I wasn't sure that this was a specific question about Wyoming State Retirement or Wyoming State Funds. But um, when it's about the retirement, I'm also uh, part of that retirement plan. And, and um, it is, uh, they've just recently increased uh, the amount that the newer, uh, the people that are still working in pay again to, uh, to bring that up to, I think it's 100 and two percent is what they're what they're looking to increase to so they're working towards it although um, we have a pretty good rating with our retirement and i don't anticipate any kind of thing uh, retirement system collapsing if you're referring to the state budget as a whole you know 72 percent of our state funds come from the extraction industries and as we all know there's a lot of volatility in those prices and then with some of the prices becoming depressed with coal uh, companies going bankrupt and in some of those kinds of areas so our revenue coming in is, it has been cut. Thank you. There's a question back over here. I was just wondering, um, you know, you with the mic here. <laughs> You talk about the University of Wyoming. There's a lot of other state employees um, here in the state. I agree with Mr. Sherrard. Um, you know, they're doing all these great improvements on facilities in, in, in uh, Cheyenne and across the state. But what is your stance on giving state employee raises when several of them haven't had raises for over eight years? And, you know, I mean, that to me is a big morale decreaser because the employees would rather go someplace else where they can at least get a raise. 
Leanne, I'll let you take that one first. Well, there um, are some huge issues in pay and inequities across state agencies. And uh, uh, for instance, at the Department of Family Services, there are social workers that are being hired that are being paid more than their supervisor of 20 years. There was a study, I think it was called the Hayes Study, on uh, pay across uh, state employees. And um, that study has so many flaws that we need to look at a different way of how we pay. Um, that's the first thing, is to make sure that we are equal across the board. And then second thing, um, we all, they all do need a raise. There's a lot that have been working for many years, as you said, eight years without a raise. So that's not even a COLA. Um, but uh, I also want to, to look at individual agencies. There are some agencies that I feel are very top heavy. Senator Hicks. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the University of Wyoming and you're quoting Al there. One of the reasons you're quoting Al is not pay at the University of Wyoming. The University of Wyoming was a land grant college established under the Morrill Act, who said that your primary responsibilities now was to teach agriculture engineering and military, and military tactics. You have to understand that this was passed during the Civil War in 1862. That's what established our land grant university system today. What has happened over a period of time is our faculty at the university forgot that they worked for land grant university and they thought they worked for anything they wanted to. So we're bringing that back and say the focus of that university, and it goes on to say in the Moral Act is it says as per subjects, additional subjects as prescribed by the legislature. The legislature has been deficient and missing in action and taking more role in guiding what the University of Wyoming does. With it. I think we've corrected that. So back to the other issues. The Hay study, whether it's flawed or not, is a study to look at market-based pay for not only just state employees, but anybody else employed in that field. So if you're an engineer with LIDAR, it looks at what do engineers make in the private sector, and what the Hay study does, and what the Wyoming legislature has tried to do is fund 90% of that market value for those state employees. Time. We have increased Time. benefits to state employees. Time. Thank you. Any other questions in the audience? Mr. Hay. Yes, I've got a little bit to do. He can actually answer this and then he can give you how you want to answer it. Um, when Wyoming went into a recession, one of the things that the governor did, he got up and said, everybody has to cut. Uh, my mother-in-law is on dialysis and she was on a program, I don't know that name, but the one medication, uh, the state was picking up because it's a very expensive medication. And her Medicare and Medicaid. She had all that, but it did not cover that. So Wyoming dropped that. Uh, and thank God the dialysis uh, company she had picked it up eventually. But in the meantime, she was having to pay that much money for uh, one pill. Okay. Uh, it was very expensive. So my question is. This program is out there to actually help the citizens who work all their lives, pay their taxes, still pay taxes, um, they're the cream of the crop, okay, they're, they're, they're the element. And then it wasn't long after that, you talk, of, you talk about 500 million deficit, that Wyoming the legislature spent $230 million while in a recession to rebound the capital. So why would you take when we have citizens hurting, and, and she's not going, they took away from everybody. So why would you take something that benefits the citizens who pay the taxes for this state and work here most of their lives, and then turn around, sorry, and then turn around and uh, spend 230 on some building that really needed now, as you said, you know, do we have to pay for it now? So that's my question to both. Senator Hicks. That's an excellent question. And I want to tell you, the legislature passed it. I voted against the capital construction bill. 
I voted against the capital rehabilitation, $300 million in a time when we shouldn't have been spending money. This year, we just spent $300 million on more capital construction for office buildings for state employees in Casper, for the Life Resource Center, for the state hospital in Evanston, for schools. We built ourselves to the point where you run into the philosophy that we have certain individuals in the legislature who think their job is to use your tax dollars to fund certain industries in the state of Wyoming. I voted against every one of those for the very reason that you stated, because we have like misappropriated money for buildings over people. And I voted against every one of those bills. I stood on the floor of the Senate three years ago and ran a member to strip $300 million of pork barrel projects for individuals in the state of Wyoming because of this. Bypass and Jackson Holes and bridges in Evansville Hi. when we were funding the basic necessities of public health and services. It's a responsibility of government. Thank you. Leanne, do you have a response? I'm sorry about what your mother-in-law went through, but um, it's a program that I'm, I'm not familiar with. Um, however, uh, you know, the state of Wyoming has turned down several times Medicaid expansion. And um, the, the legislature has turned it down. The people want it. The doctors' association wants it. The hospital association wants it. Uh, the majority of the people want it. It should pass. That should help in some instances, though. I think the program that you're referring to is probably a specialized program. Um, I would like to learn more about it. I do think it's that people should be before buildings as well. So we, we agree on that. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Oh, Scott and Byron get to flip coins. Put your mic on. He raised the hand. Rochambeau. Okay, Scott. He gave it to you. You owe him one. A short, short answer here. Yes or no. Would you support legislation to lift tax exempt status from entities that compete in the private sector? Leanne, I'll let you go first. I, uh, as a way to raise revenue, would like to look at all those special exemptions across the board and make sure that all of them are still viable, that they are still something that is the desire of people of Wyoming. I'd also like to um, support, um, make sure that all the taxes that are due, due to us are being collected correctly. Those two things uh, are primary, but uh, yes. Senator Hayes. Yes, with the exception. And the exception is, is we have to compete with our neighbors. So if you want to ship all of your industry over to Nebraska, Colorado, and all these other states that provide those exemptions, then by all means get rid of those exemptions. If it was a level playing field, we had absolute free markets that could work the way they were supposed to. It's competitive as heck out there. If you want to maintain manufacturing and some of these other industries, they're going to go someplace else and take the jobs over there because they get those tax exemptions. So that's the exception. On a level playing field, absolutely you heard the exemptions. But where it's not a level playing field, we got to play the game. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and especially thanks to the candidates for coming, and thank you for running for these offices. It's still about we the people, so we the people need to keep participating on all levels. So thank you very much.